Okay, the recording is started. Um, and I, I am happy to introduce to you Dr. Ton Ong. He's an associate professor in the Division of Gerontology and Geriatric Medicine at UW and a clinician educator. Dr. Ong practices both primary care and consultative geriatrics in the inpatient and post-acute care settings. He focuses on promoting healthy lifestyles in older adults and in educating health professionals to be competent in the care of the older adult. And he's the medical director for UW's post-acute care at Harborview and section chief in the Division of Gerontology and Geriatric Medicine. And he's gonna be talking to us today about delirium in older adults. Welcome, Dr. Ong. Thank you, Dr. Cochran. Is my volume okay? Perfect. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining this late afternoon. It's kind of cloudy out here in Seattle and please excuse me if I take a sip of my hot tea here. I'm nursing a little sore throat here. I'm rest reassured, I'm pretty sure it's not COVID. I did have a COVID test and I'm at home. So I have no financial disclosures. Uh, so no conflict of interest with any industry or research. And hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, the goals and the objectives are listed here that the participants today will be able to identify delirium in your older adults that you engage with in your various different practices. Hopefully you'll be able to recognize some risk factors for individuals and clients that will develop delirium during their uh, aging process. And then in that process, also think about preventative intervention plans for those individuals who are at risk of developing delirium, and then also develop a management plan once an individual does develop delirium. So those are some of the objectives for today's talk. We'll start off with a case here, and I think that for those individuals who have seen delirium, this is probably something that is incredibly common and it sticks into your memory. Uh, and this is an 82 year old woman who is currently residing in a skilled nursing facility. And that's where I primarily work uh, for the most part. And this is a woman who had a prior cerebral vascular accident. So she had a stroke before, but now she's been hospitalized for pneumonia. And so now she's being seen in the hospital. And at the time of the admission, the nurse uh, at the bedside notes that she's very pleasant. And within the notation that it was documented that she was alert and oriented times three. On examination the, the following day though, um, there are some, some changes. Her vital signs are still stable and chest x-ray shows that she has evidence of a pneumonia. And she's also a CT head shows that she had this um, change within her brain that was very consistent of her prior old infarct that she had. Now her mentation is a little different compared to what the bedside nursing had noted before. Now she's awakens to her name, but she closes her eyes for long periods during the interview. She's very tired and she really doesn't want to talk. And when she does and she opens her eyes, she's easily distracted by the noises within the hallway, constantly peering over the interviewer at that point and staring in, into the hallway. So very easily dis distracted. And because of this distraction, um, the questions have to be repeated quite often. And when asked where she thinks that she is, she thinks that she's in a hotel. And during her interview, it's also documented that she appears restless most of the time. And she's often picking at her bed when she appears a little bit more uh, agitated. The only new medication that was started for her was an antibiotic treating her pneumonia when she was hospitalized. So this clinical picture that is painted is probably familiar for those of you who practice in clinical medicine in uh, many of your clients who have developed delirium. So other than the physical exam findings and how it was described, there's actually a DSM-5 criteria for people with delirium. And you may have talked about this already in your 3Ds talk earlier within this, um, in, within the six weeks prior before this. And this is what psychiatrists use for the most part to diagnose someone with delirium. So very similar to that case that we had, this person displayed inattention. So where a person has this uh, changes in, in their level of consciousness and it's a reduced inability to focus. So this woman was constantly easily distracted, for example. There's also a change in the cognition, 
and also development of new perceptual disturbance. And this is in the setting of people who may develop hallucinations. This wasn't described with, within that context within the case, but there's a, actually a change in a person's cognition and visual or auditory hallucinations. Most of the times it's visual for the most part. One of the other hallmarks about delirium is that it's also acute on onset and it's also fluctuating within a course. And so meaning that within an interview that you could come back within minutes or hours at a time and then their level of consciousness is different at that point. And there's also the evidence of the physical or a organic cause of it as well. So this is the criteria that most psychiatrists would use to make a diagnosis of delirium. But for the most of the lay people though, I think that what we will notice most is the behaviors, the symptoms and, and the signs. And so this graph or this table here just illustrates the most common behavior signs and some of the symptoms that you'll see one of your clients or one of your patients will have. You will see that it would also captures many of the findings that were on the DASM-5 criteria as well, this, particularly this acute and onset. And so this is one of the distinguishing factors from dementia per se. So where dementia, this progressive decline in someone's cognition, delirium is very abrupt in, in, in onset. The other thing that you'll notice is that a person may have agitation as, as well, the altered level of consciousness that we talked about, and also this confusion. And sometimes this evidence of this confusion makes it hard to distinguish for some clinicians from the differences between delirium and the dementia. But it's the abrupt change that is one of the distinguishing hallmarks between delirium and the dementia. The person can develop new de delusions. And so this is uh, different from the hallucinations where a delusion is this kind of this fixed and false belief or a wrong judgment to, um, uh, other than what is presented to an individual. One of the common and most common delusions that you may encounter is the de delusion of paranoia that something is out to get um, that patient who is suffering delirium, for example. There, that individual could also have disinhibition, that frontal cortex that stops us from doing uh, inappropriate things and could be disinhibited at that point for those individuals who display dis, uh, delirium. Disorganized thinking could also be a sign uh, of individuals who are suffering from delirium, but also from dementia, which we'll kind of talk about. And this fluctuating and waxing and waning course is another hallmark that will set it apart from individuals with dementia. So people with delirium, you will have that waxing and waning course that we that is part of the hallmark of the DSM-5 criteria. But individuals with dementia with pre-existing cognitive impairment without delirium, it's this progressive course of their neurodegenerative disease versus this waxing and waning that you'll see with delirium. The hallucinations we talked about, and so it could be auditory and it could be also visual, most of part, it could be visual. And there's actually, in some cases, you will actually have other types of hallucinations. And so on this taste, on this table, it lists olfactory, and so you could have smell or taste or even touch. Um, I haven't come across that very often, but those are all possibilities as well. The inattention, uh, we, we talked about people can be irritable, labile, and also incredibly psychotic as well, losing touch with reality. Uh, and the restlessness is what we will see as well and with people who are delirious. Now, the signs and symptoms are so um, abrupt and so significant, you would think that it's incredibly common, which is it is. And so 30% of individuals over 70 years of age who are admitted to a hospital develop delirium. This is compared to people within the generalized community. And so people, when people are seen in a primary care practice, it's not very often that we see a person that is acutely delirious who is not hospitalized. And so usually within the community setting, you'll see it to anywhere between one to 2%. So relatively rare compared to people who are acutely ill. And the, of these 30% of these people who are admitted over in, into the hospital that have delirium, 50% of these individuals will have delirium at the time of their admission. Another half of these people will eventually develop delirium during their hospital stay at some point. And then as you progress within these different bullets, as people become more acutely ill or that they go through um, surgery and 
places extra additional stress within their body that it, it, an older adult suffers um, delirium. So you could see that delirium increases as a person becomes either more progressively ill or experiencing more stressors within their life, such as end of life uh, issues that an older adult might experience. Of note of that second bullet, uh, where nearly a quarter of the individuals who develop delirium in a post-operative state, um, that's incredibly interesting. And at least from my perspective, because this, which we'll talk a little bit more and talk about some in interventions to prevent that potentially from happening. And this is even within a population that are uh, individuals and patients that are elective. So these are planned procedures that they went to go see their primary care uh, provider or they had some sort of preoperative assessment and said, yes, you are fit enough to go for surgery. These are all the things that we could prepare before your surgery. But yet a quarter of those individuals still have developed postoperative delirium. And if you could think about uh, in a prepared state, if it's that common that in an unprepared state that uh, cases of delirium or the incidence of delirium is even more common. So in semi-urgent cases such as hip fractures presenting to the emergency room, over 50% of individuals would develop postoperative delirium. Although it's in incredibly common within a hospitalized and sick older adult, it's oftentimes under-recognized. And so nearly over 50% to 80% of cases are, are missed, and only 20% of these cases are identified by, by the bedside nurse. And unfortunately, physicians do um, pretty much the same as, as well. So a quarter of only a quarter of these cases are identified by, by the physicians. And part of the reason why it's so under-recognized is partially because it's its fluctuating nature and its course is that in a system, in the current healthcare system that we have, we have lots of handoffs. So people will have shifts of their work. And so it's hard to capture that fluctuating course unless it's captured with a note or it's captured within the sign out. And assessment tools aren't routinely used, although it's, it's accessible, it's not routinely used within a hospitalized setting or other types of settings, which we'll talk about as well. And for the nurses who have the primary role of the delirium care, sometimes the physician or the nurse practitioner or the prescribing physician a uh, prescribing provider um, aren't aware about the information that the bedside nurses may have. It just stems from a lack of communication. And then the last reason why a person could have under recognition of delirium is that when an individual has superimposed cognitive impairment, such as dementia, it makes delirium kind of hard to detect, particularly if you don't understand what the individual's baseline is prior to developing delirium. Unfortunately, all this leads to incredibly poor outcomes in older adults who develop delirium, where that there's an increase in mortality. There's also an increase in skilled nursing facility placement. So the odds ratio of the someone developing delirium increases your odds by 2.5 um, times for having a skilled nursing facility um, placement. There's also a loss of function as well. So individuals who develop delirium lose a uh, basic activities of daily living. There's also decline in cognition. Oftentimes we are taught that this decline in cognition is something that returns and is reversible. For the most part, that's true. And so what you see is a graph that is in, in front of you that is for individuals who had um, a planned surgery for a cabbage. And so these individuals had heart surgery. These were planned surgeries. And so they tested what their cognition was before their uh, cardiac surgery. And then they tested for their, what their uh, cognition was after their cardiac surgery. And so before surgery, what you see on the x-axis here and the days after their surgery, day number two, five, 30, 183, and, and eventually after a year's time. The black dotted line here are individuals who developed delirium during the post-operative stay and those individuals who did not develop delirium. 
how these researchers viewed their cognition or how they measured their cognition, the subject's cognition was using a mini mental status exam. And so you could see the individuals, uh, the score ranges from zero to 30. Most of the individuals who started here was at their baseline before surgery. But for those individuals who developed delirium, as documented by this gray line, you could see that their mental status, of course, dramatically decreased, partially because that they were delirious, of course. But one of the most more interesting features is that those individuals really took a long time, actually, to fully return back to what their baseline is. And so that cognitive impairments can persist for a relatively long period of time. And so at least when I went through medical school, I was taught that it could be days to weeks, but now with better understanding, it could be weeks to months on it. We'll continue with our case. So this woman who was admitted from a skilled nurse, nursing facility, now it's hospital day number three. And then unfortunately, the overnight physician is called. And the reason why the overnight physician was called was that this patient had pulled out her IV line. And she's incredibly confused now at that point. And so the physician orders Haldol, uh, 0 0.5 milligrams to be given time, uh, times one. And all the oral antibiotics have been changed. Excuse me, all the medications have been changed to oral because of the loss of the IV access and the antibiotics have been changed to oral. Later in the af afternoon of that day, um, she actually is more alert and she's more appropriate, uh, which is remarkable. And, and at least she tells the hospital team is that she, she doesn't remember what exactly happened. And so her vitals are listed there and they're essentially stable. She's sleepy, but arousable. Her laboratories are there. And then just for those non-physicians um, or clinicians, uh, her white blood cell count is elevated, indicating a infection and her uh, creatinine is there. And her BUN and creatinine is there, indicating her fluid hydration status. And this is what the daily note is. And it was much longer than this, of course, but I kind of summarized it here. Then this was kind of the assessment and plan. And so it talks about her pre-disposing um, uh, lung disease in terms of her C COPD, her high blood pressure, her previous stroke, her thyroid disease, fluids, electrolytes, and nutrition, talks about her code status. But what's missing from this plan? Right. And, and so because of our electronic medical record system, copy and paste it is it's so, so prevalent within the electronic medical record system. What's missing is really the presence of delirium here. And so this was recommended a while ago, back in 2010, and, and I think that it's still very much appropriate now and has been reiterated in 2018, is that delirium is a, and recognizing it is a core competency of many of trainees, particularly in internal medicine and family medicine. And not only that, as part of the daily physical exam, it's recommended that all hospitalized older adult patients get assessed and document whether delirium is present. I would actually go a little further just to not to say that it's present, but also that it's absent. And I think that's incredibly important as, as well as it, because it gives a person you know, that, that person who's going to be taking care of them in the next shift to understand if it's actually absent, if it's missing or not. It's kind of an understanding if there was a new murmur or a, a old murmur. And so documentation of the heart murmur or the lack of one is very helpful for the next provider who might be able to pick up a new murmur as well. Okay. There's actually a great screening tool out, out there. And so this is to address that issue that there's no uh, standardized uh, screening tool that is used. There's actually some really good ones. And one of the best well-researched one out there is the confusion assessment method. Sharon, in a way, is a guru within, in delirium and she spent her entire career on, on, on this. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna summarize some of her outstanding work. And you would see that many of the aspects of the confusion assessment method overlap as well with the DSM-5 criteria that we had talked about. So again, it has the acute onset and fluctuating in, in course. And you also have to have inattention as well. Plus you have to have one of these items, either number three or number four, either the disorganized thinking, 
or the altered level of consciousness. And then if you have those things, one and two plus one other additional item, you have an individual who is delirious and has screened positive for a delirium. So you don't have to be a psychiatrist to be able to diagnose someone with delirium. One caveat with the confusion assessment method that it should not be used with people who live with severe dementia. And part of it makes logical sense. If you look at the screening tool and what is incorporated in this, people with severe dementia can definitely have inattention. A person with severe dementia can have disorganized thinking. And so individuals with severe dementia already at baseline, they will already have two of these items all already. And so they're, and, and so it's not uh, suggested to be used in people with severe dementia. And how good is this screening tool? And this is an article that summarizes how essentially that, that question. And by far the best evidence supports confusion assessment method at to be used as your best screening tool. The likelihood ratio is incredibly strong in terms of near, nearly 10, and the negative uh, likelihood ratio is also good as, as well. Believe it or not, the mini mental status exam was the least useful for detecting uh, whether or not a person has delirium. There are several others, and I listed their acronyms there just so that you know that um, that there are others as well, but by far the confusion and assessment method is the best studied out there. The CAC stands for Clinical Assessment of Confusion. The DOS stands for Delirium Observation Screening Scale. DST stands Digit Span Test. GAR stands for Global Attentiveness Rating. MDSA stands for Memorial Delirium Assessment Scale. And I believe the DRS stands for delirium rating scale. And so these are all different screening tools used in different environments, but by far the CAM is the most widely used and best studied again. It's so well studied is that for those individuals who practice in skilled nursing facilities are probably very familiar with it already because it's already incorporated into the minimum data set. And the minimum data set is a requirement that all nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities who accepts CMS funds are required to perform on a periodic basis on their residents. And so it's incorporated in a periodic routine assessment on all skilled nursing facility residents. And you could see that, again, it incorporates those things within um, the, um, the confusion assessment method. Not only can you detect the presence or absence of delirium, but there's also a what is CAM-S, Confusion Assessment Method S. And what the S stands for is to grade the severity. And this study that is listed here within brackets here actually studied not only can you measure whether or not it's present or absent, but you could also measure it in terms of its severity and mild, moderate, and also severe. And this was validated using a prospective cohort study. Not only can you measure it, whether how severe it is, but the severity was actually linked to important clinical outcomes, which is actually the more um, important aspect of the CAM-S. This is a picture of what the CAM-S is and looks like. And so yes, you, if it's acute on onset, so it's a yes or no. But in the inattention component here that you can actually be able to mark whether or not it's mild or marked. The same thing with disorganized thinking and also the same thing with altered level of consciousness. Well, you can mark if a person's altered level of consciousness is mild or if it's marked, either defined as stupor or in coma. And then it gives you a, a severity score at the very bottom here. This graph or table could be a little bit busy, but what it is meant to show is that how it's linked to those important clinical outcomes that we had talked about. You could see here that the important clinical outcomes that were discussed or measured is death within 90 days, death or nursing home residents within 90 days. So whether a person was placed within a nursing home environment or, uh, at the 90 day mark, or if there's persistent functional decline still at the 30 day mark. And this is the short form CAMS where it looked at low, moderate, and high, the summation of those scores that we just had showed on the previous slide. 
And you could see that based upon this is that the more severe forms of the more severe your delirium was using the CAMS, the more uh, uh, well, the more relative risk that you had for uh, having these poor outcomes. Uh, and so that's how useful it is to identifying the severity of a person's delirium, just not only the absence or presence, but also the severity as well. We're gonna enter into another case here. And this is case number two, and this is a preoperative case. Um, and so this is a 81 year old gentleman who has pre-existing high blood pressure and a history of coronary artery disease who had a stent place. Uh, he's also a diabetic and who unfortunately suffered a ground level fall. Uh, and this ground level fall resulted in a right elbow fracture and he's being evaluated in the emergency room. This individual has a pre-existing past medical history in, of osteoarthritis, uh, hearing impairment, cataracts, and glaucoma as, as well, and with his current vision as 2100. His medications are listed here. Uh, so I apologize for the abbreviations. This is aspirin. This is basically a diuretic, that a combination diuretic that is being used to treat for his hi hypertension, metoprolol and lisinopril, metformin and glipizide, the last two medications on this list for diabetes, the metoprolol and lisinopril for his coronary artery disease and hypertension. So very, very appropriate medications and uh, standard of care. His social history um, of permanence is that he drinks one glass of wine with dinner. On examination, it's pretty unremarkable for, the except for that he's overweight. Uh, his laboratories are listed there, uh, essentially unremarkable, except for B, UN to creatinine that is slightly elevated, this ratio, a sign of dehydration, uh, and his EKG is also unremarkable. The reason why I'm pulling all these salient points about his medical history is because that as a clinician and as an internist and as a geriatrician who practice as a, at a level one trauma center, oftentimes our trauma surgeons will ask us to risk stratify a patient. And what that means is how fit are they for surgery? Is there something else can we do to minimize the risk of having a, car a cardiac event during surgery or post-operatively? And so there's different ways that we could risk stratify that. Um, within internal medicine, and, and there is different scoring systems uh, as well. We could use metabolic equivalents, and so assessing how functional a person is, there's different risk scoring uh, algorithms as, as well. We're not going to belabor or go into that, but just know that there's a cardiac risk assessment, to, and at the end of it, it spits out a number, says this is the likelihood that this individual with this predisposing risk factors will have a cardiac event with this type of surgery, okay? But what about developing delirium? So this person is older and what about their delirium risk in a preoperative state? Because we have talked about one of the previous bullets at the very beginning of this talk. It's incredibly common, particularly in people who have urgent need for surgery. And we'll answer that question. So this gentleman already had some pre-existing risk factors that are on this list as, as well. So advanced age, so he's 81 years old, pre-existing cognitive impairment, which wasn't there, but is a risk factor, a his, history of stroke, which this gentleman does not have, a history of Parkinson's disease or any type of neurodegenerative disease, any multiple comorbid conditions that a person has, can have sensory impairment in terms of vision or hearing is a predisposing risk factor for developing delirium. Any psychoactive medications, and thankfully in this case that this person did not have any psychoactive medications, any pre-existing functional impairment, and also any history of alcohol abuse as well. So these are predisposing risk factors that for the most part, as an internist and a geriatrician, I really can't alter too much about it at the point that I'm seeing them in the emergency room, okay? So a lot of risk factors that are there. NICE, which is, stands for the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. It's the equivalent of the 
AHRQ within the US, um, there's actually um, some risk factors that they also I identify that are risk factors. And th these risk factors are moderate to high risk. So if you're 65 years and older, that is one of the risk factors. If you have pre-existing cognitive impairment, that is a risk factor. If you currently have a hip fracture, that would be a, a risk factor. So our individual has an elbow fracture, thank goodness. And if you have severe illness as, as well. And so these are all things to think about in terms of how risky a person or their risk of developing delirium. Returning back to Sharon Inouye's work though, she also has developed in a perspective study looking at, well, what are those risk factors and what is the relative risk of developing delirium? And so in her specific cohort, in her specific work, she was able to identify four risk factors that really mattered. And one of those risk factors is a decrease in vision. And so if your vision was worse than 2070 to start with, that is one risk factor. If you had severe illness and the original way that they measured it was uh, through an Apache 2 score. Um, I don't need you to do that. And Apache 2 score measures all these comorbid conditions and adds it up and spits out a number. Um, sick or not sick usually is what I teach many of my, my uh, train, trainees in internal medicine. If a person has pre-existing cognitive impairment, the original cohort that you measured this was if they had a mini mental static exam less than 24, but really just knowing whether or not a person had pre-existing cognitive impairment is good enough for me. If a person has a BUN to creatinine ratio greater than 18, again, this is a marker of a dehydration status, whether or not a person has risk factors with that. And so the cohort that she uh, looked at it was a different cohort to validate uh, these risk factors. And so what she was able to find, if you had zero of these risk factors, you had little to no risk of developing delirium. But if you had one to two of these items, you were at intermediate risk where your relative risk was 7.1. And if you had three to four of these items listed here, then you were at very high risk you know, and close to 10 uh, relative risk of developing delirium uh, during your hospitalization. And we'll talk about why that is important because there are some things that you can do about it, okay? So going back to our pre-operative case, I, what I did was I highlighted this individual's risk factor. So this risk factor, this person had a uh, risk of having poor uh, vision, uh, worse than the 2070 that we had talked about. So it's 2100. Uh, this person also had a BUN to creatinine ratio above that threshold. And so just a sign of dehydration. And so now you could think of not only can we risk stratify a person of developing a cardiac event after their surgery or during their surgery, but you could also risk stratify them of developing delirium in, in, during their hospital course. So in this individual, they're at intermediate risk of developing delirium. And so we'll talk about how I would implement that into clinical practice for my patients and my clients as well, okay? So just a couple of tips for improving the patient care, just to summarize, is to risk stratify your patients and just really think about, is there visual impairment? Is there pre-existing cognitive impairment? And do I need to do perform a screen? Is my patient or my client severely ill at this point? And what is their volume status? Is it fully optimized at, at that point? Okay. So we talked about pre disposing risk factors. So these are things that are innate mostly within the patient or your client, but there are also precipitating factors. And these precipitating factors are things, unfortunately, that their environment or us as the physician, we do to them for the most part. Um, or it could be an acute exacerbation that, that they have of their chronic medical prob problem. It could be the surgery or the anesthesia, that extra added stress that we're placing upon their body um, because of their injury, and that could precipitate delirium. It could be new medications that were started. It could be uncontrolled or untreated pain. The environmental change of being hospitalized and taking out of uh, and putting an individual into a foreign environment. 
could be the physical restraints and fortune that we are using on individuals and also chemical restraints as well. Similar to our very first case where Haldol was, was, was given. Could it be that an individual has urinary retention or fecal impaction from constipation or obstipation? Electrolyte disturbances because we're keeping them uh, without food, uh, for example, and also leading to dehydration and malnutrition as well. And so there are definitely precipitating factors during a person's hospital course or when they enter into a healthcare setting, any type of healthcare setting, for example, in a skilled nursing facility that can precipitate delirium as well. And so this is looking at the more, um, the higher risk factors, uh, the culprits usually the, uh, that are listed and within the literature, physical restraints increases your relative risk the most. So if you can get your physical restraints off, that is a blessing. Malnutrition as well. If a person has three or more medications that were added, that's unfortunately a, another a precipitating risk factor. And if there was a Foley catheter that was placed as well, that is also a pre, uh, precipitating risk factor as well. And so these are four of the more common precipitating risk factors for delirium. And so how, uh, how you could think about it is this graph here. It's a relationship um, between predisposing and precipitating risk factors. So you could say that our individual in our preoperative case there had some predisposing risk factor that kind of the, in the intermediate range. And so they might fall along this paragraph or this line right here, right, slap, right down in the middle. And then if you have precipitating factors where that it increases their delirium, it might be up here. And so the more precipitating factors they encounter, the higher that their, their risk. But also if you could think of an individual where their predisposing factors, where their risk factors, they have more predisposing risk factors, they're over here, it takes less precipitating factors to precipitate delirium or to, to uh, lead to incident delirium. And vice versa could be same, is that an individual might not have a lot of predisposing factors way down here, but because they're acutely ill and they've been placed into this new environment, they're in restraints, they have a full catheter, they have all these new medications, um, they might be way up here because of the precipitating factors. What I'm gonna talk about can be found in this, and this was in 2015, but it's still very, very uh, pertinent as well. These were highlights from American Geriatric Society talking about the clinical practice guidelines for managing delirium in older adults. They specifically talk about post-operative uh, delirium in older adults, but many of the things that they talk about can be extrapolated to just delirium in hospitalized older adults as well. What they do call out is prevention versus treatment. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that. And so it's an, important to distinguish between preventing delirium from happening versus treating delirium as well. They also call out uh, the decrease in delirium severity and the duration if you're able to implement some of these uh, practice guidelines and also some of the potential harms that are associated with that. Within the practice guidelines, they talk about anesthesia depth, the type of anesthesia. They also talk about the regional anesthesia, pain as well, avoidance of inappropriate medications and prophylactic antipsychotic use. For the most part, we're not gonna talk anything about this for the most part, but I do you know, encourage you to take a look at that practice guideline uh, if you want more information. But this table really uh, summarizes their, their findings is that um, there's very little strength for the type of anesthesia and the quality of the studies are low in terms of anesthesia impact upon people's, uh, on older adults' incidence of delirium. But what does show strongly is pain control and also the use of certain um, pain medicines as, as well and avoiding certain medications. So the strength of that is, is uh, very strong. And then what they also show is that there's insufficient information on prophylactic antipsychotic use. And so what that means is similar to our case, um, our first case when we opened up, 
for that woman to develop delirium, there's some studies and limited data on prophylactically giving people the Haldol or another antipsychotic uh, or a drug in its case before they develop delirium to prevent delirium from happening. Um, and but there's insufficient data to really to, to show that and the studies are of low quality and there are numerous harms associated with that. And we will talk about that just, just a, a little bit uh, within this slide. And these are additional resources for, for, for you to think about as, as well. What I would say is that most of these studies were underpowered, very similar to what the uh, AGS practice guidelines talks about. Most of these studies have used Haldol. And the most important thing is that most of these people are in the intensive care unit. And so they're acutely ill severely acutely ill. And so that's why they need intensive care unit stay. For the most part, when we talk about interventions to prevent delirium and that um, in the following slides, what we're talking about is on your med surge beds or your med surge floors. So these are non ICU level of care. Uh, and many of the studies have variable doses and duration of doses as, as well. Okay, and so it's hard to extrapolate how that could be used for older adults. Okay, but one of the things that does help to reduce delirium, and this is where it talks about prevention, as well, uh, prevention of delirium is help. And so what help stands for is stands for the Hospital Elder Life Program. And again, this was developed by Dr. E in a way's work. What it was able to show is that if you implement this non pharmacologic intervention, you were able to reduce delirium by nearly 5% compared to usual standard of care. And so what that number needed to treat was 20. What that number needed to treat means is for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it basically means that for every um, individual to get a reduction of delirium, you have to treat 20 patients or subjects to get that one outcome, which is actually a really good number needed to treat actually. So usually a number needed to treat that would be considered good is within 70s, for example. So 20 is actually quite remarkable. One of the most important things to really know about help too is that once delirium occurred, the non-pharmacologic interventions that we're about to show associated with help really no statistical benefit. But there was a trend though, there was a trend to benefit, but there was no statistical significance that was shown. And that's really talking about research, where that there was no statistical difference between the intervention arm versus the control, but there was a trend to benefit, where it showed that there was a reduced total number of days of delirium, and there was a total uh, number of reduction of delirium episodes as, as well. And those individuals who, um, uh, sorry, and, and also the study showed that there was a reduction in functional decline in the intervention as well. So it sounds like a no brainer for the most part, it seems, right? All right, now let me show you what help looks like. And then you could see why it's so hard to implement sometimes. And so these are the non-pharmacologic management and targeted interventions within help. There was a cognitive impairment to address pre-existing cognitive impairment, but also to uh, engage patients in terms of their cognition when they were hospitalized. It addressed immobility because all patients who get admitted to the hospital uh, are often encouraged not to get out of bed, of course. And so uh, we encourage dismobility because of that. There was also addressing the sensory impairment in terms of visual impairment and also hearing impairment. There was also a uh, arm within this non-pharmacologic intervention to address dehydration and malnutrition within hospitalized older adults. And then lastly, also sleep deprivation. And we'll go through this one by one, okay. The, how this original study was developed and ran was that they had volunteers to be able to do this. The other thing that I will also um, mention too is that with whatever health system that you practice in, as I describe it, you might actually recognize that, that your health system has implemented 
different pieces and parts of help, and you might not even know it actually until it's described to you. Okay. So one of the interventions that they targeted was cognitive impairments. And so what they did was that for people who were hospitalized, older adults who were hospitalized, that they had an orientation board. And what this orientation board was, this, this big white dry eraser board where they put the date and the time. And they also placed the communication and the schedule of what the day was going to look like. And so they also taught their visitors and their volunteers and their staff that when you engage with a patient who was hospitalized, that you would orient them. So for example, if I was a, seeing somebody within the hospital today, I would say, hello, my name is Dr. Wong. Today is May 3rd, I think, 2022, and it's Tuesday. And so they would just do that routinely uh, without being prompted. So they encouraged all visitors and also their staff members and volunteers to orient people to that. And there was also therapeutic activities too. And this was to stimulate people's minds while they were within their hospitalization. And so there was discussion of current events that was uh, uh, done by the volunteer. There were also word games that were given to patients when they were sitting there as, as well and laying there within the hospital waiting to improve um, from their acute illness. And for those individuals who had pre-existing cognitive impairment, what they did for those individuals is that they did reminiscent therapy. And so some sort of structured rem reminiscent therapy. So for example, if a patient thought that they were in the 1960s, the volunteer then just was in the moment with that individual and they went back in time with them and there was no point at that point, uh, no point to reorient them and then say, actually it's 2022, because that just increased the person's paranoia and agitation as well. Uh, and so there wasn't this attempt to reorient those individuals who had pre-existing cognitive impairment. So that was their cognitive arm. To address the um, dismobility was that they had their volunteers emulate patients three times a day. And for those individuals who were unable to emulate they actually range in motion in large joints three times a day, ankles, knees, hips, elbows, shoulders, wrists. And so just range of motion of large joints just three times a day. And they encourage to minimize the use of immobilizing equipment. So being tethered, for example, to a Foley catheter, and they definitely minimize the use of, of restraints uh, at that point. For those individuals that had vision impairment, uh, they made sure that all individuals had visual aids. So they either had their glasses at bedside and glasses were on when they were awake, or they individuals who didn't have glasses, they had magnifying lenses uh, to help people read within the hospitalized setting if they didn't have access to their own glasses. They had adaptive equipment to address the low vision or uh, of patients. They had large keypad telephones so that people can easily dial, large print books that they could read. And for those of you who have ever been hospitalized, um, it's really hard to find that call light, particularly if it doesn't light up. And so what these researchers did was they did, took a fluorescent tape and they just taped it on to the call light. So it glowed in the middle of the night. And so when it was hard to find uh, and make, making it easier, to find for that hard to find essential item when you're hospitalized. Uh, and there was a daily reinforcement of the use of all of these things as well. Addressing another sensory impairment was hearing. And so when during the interview process and screening process, if the uh, volunteer had to raise their, their voice, they did a really novel thing. They actually examined their ear and they looked inside their ear and if there was wax within their ear, they disimpacted the wax. And if they still had to raise their voice to be able to speak to a person, there was a pocket talker that was available. And for those of you who are not familiar with what a pocket talker is, it's a portable uh, device that just amp amp amplifies uh, the sound. So the patient or the client in themselves would have a set of headphones and the pocket talker has a mic that you can talk into and that amplifies the sound uh, that the patient then can hear. To address fluid status and hydration, 
they taught their volunteers to be able to feed and to also provide assistance to feeding as 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 well. And one of the things I think that that is problematic is that if you've ever been hospitalized before, you've been in a hospitalized setting, that um, there's a disconnect between food services and how it, they integrate within the team, within the within the hospital team. And so oftentimes when I'm rounding late in the afternoon at lunchtime, I see a food tray that is on the, the rolling tray, but unfortunately it's put to the side. And if it, you have an older adult who's post-operative aware that they have functional impairments or um, cog impairment, and they want food, it's hard to get access to that food. And so what they taught their volunteers was to make sure that the food was in front of people and set up. The other thing that they had their volunteers do was that they had a cart of water. And so um, buckets of water that they would actually go down the hall to each patient's room and just preemptively offered water. So late in the afternoon, there was a volunteer that would push around a cart of uh, little containers of water and they would go to each individual and say, would you like some water? That was their intervention. What they also wanted to intervene upon is also sleep. Um, because studies have shown that the initiation of medications, particularly sedative hypnotics to help people sleep can precipitate delirium. So before a patient who, or before a subject was in the study, uh, could ask for a sedative hypnotic if they had trouble sleeping. They had to ask for three things. And what those three things were is that you had to ask for a warm drink. And that warm drink could be in the form of the milk or herbal tea. And so what our moms had maybe have told us and taught us before, warm glass of milk works to help, help you sleep. This is what they implemented. So a warm glass of milk or herbal tea for those individuals who are lactose intolerant. And if you were still awake, is that what you could ask for is to listen to a relaxation tape. So it was soft, pleasing music or soft, pleasing sounds. And if you were still awake after listening to that relaxation tape, you could ask for a back rub. And if you were still awake after an hour, you could ask for a sedative hypnotic as after that was allowed. And so what they was able to show in a separate study that we won't show or talk about is that they actually took this study and looked at it in one of their community hospitals at Yale where Sharon in a way was at, at that time. And they were able to show that there was a dose response between this intervention and the use of sedative hypnotics. And so stated in a different way, the more that individuals and subjects actually did all three of these, the less likely that they were able to not use a sedative hypnotic. And so if you were able to do two out of the three, you were less likely to use a sedative hypnotic compared to only doing one out of, out of the three. And so there was a definitely a dose response curve to this targeted intervention for insomnia itself. But the more important thing though is within help, it is incredibly expansive, right? We talked about all these non-farm agents and interventions to address delirium. But the most important thing that I take away from it, it was actually a dose response that they were able to show as well with those six interventions that we just described. So the more that you did of those interventions, the more bang for your buck for, for uh, reducing delirium. And this is what this graph essentially had shows is that for people that adherent score shows that if you were able to do zero out of the one of the interventions, two out of the four of the interventions or maybe five to six is that the more that you did was the more that you had decreased the risk of developing delirium. And so lower scale here uh, indicates the less of risk of developing delirium, which kind of makes sense from a geriatric perspective in general, because all these little things that we do add up because we know that delirium is multifactorial. And so the more that you are able to do, the, le the more likely you're able to reduce the risk of that outcome. And, and if you are engaging with older adults or work with older adults, commonly, 
falls is a prototypical geriatric syndrome. The same thinking that we applied to falls is kind of what we applied to delirium as, as well. There's a bunch of different risk factors that are related to an older adult falling, uh, more, much, much more than that is displayed here on this slide. But you could imagine that if you address someone's lower extremity weakness or you address their, envi their, envi their environmental factors, it doesn't make it all go away, but it makes it better. It makes their fall risk better. And so delirium, fortunately, is able to show that it's a dose response. And it's that if you address someone's sensory impairment, if you address someone's um, uh, dysmobility, if you address someone's fluid status and hydration, it reduces the person's risk of developing delirium, okay? So what I will do is that I do wanna summarize this a, a little bit is that what AGS did is that they look through the data and there's an incredibly strong strength of evidence that multi-component non-pharmacologic intervention particularly help hospital elder life program prevents delirium. So incredibly strong data there. The quality is moderate and the costs and or the harm that we had talked about, it's really costly in terms of staff time but it's actually maybe offset by the length of stay and the decrease in delirium, uh, the number of days a uh, hospitalized older adult has delirium, and also the functional decline that we see as well. But for the management of delirium, though, like once delirium has already occurred, the strength of the, the evidence, unfortunately, is weaker at that point, and the quality is low as well. So it's much harder to manage delirium once it has already occurred, much better to prevent it first, okay? I'm gonna introduce a concept here called prehab. And so for those of you who have been around long enough in uh, clinical medicine, you might have heard of prehab for older adults. The concept is that, can you get physically strong and well enough before you have surgery? And so, post rehabilitation. Uh, and so people will go through rehab after their surgery, but how about doing rehab before your surgery and getting as strong and fit as possibly can? And so there's a lot of data and a lot of literature on physical prehabilitation. But these authors here wanted to look at cognitive prehabilitation. So this was a single site um, blinded randomized trial that they were elicited and were able to recruit 250 subjects, a little over that. This occurred at the Ohio State University Medical Center, and this was from March 2015 to August 2019. So right before the pandemic hit. Uh, and so Thankfully, they were able to recruit all their participants before the pandemic hit at, at that point. They recruited people 60, uh, above 60 years of age who were planning to have major surgery. And these major surgeries were non-cardiac, non-neurological, and these surgeries were going to be under general anesthesia. And the expected length of hospital stay was going to be three days or more, so over 72 hours. They excluded a couple of different uh, individuals, excuse me, a, a, a populations here. Who they excluded were people who had a modified mini mental status score of, of less than 26. And so trying to screen out for pre existing cognitive impairment. Uh, and if your education level was less than high school, then your mini mental status was less than 24. They also excluded people who had evidence of active depression. So, and they screened this through a geriatric depression scale of a score of greater than nine. And so those are the people that they excluded. So people who had pre-existing cognitive impairment or people with active depression. Uh, and what these uh, uh, subjects were then randomized to, they had a control arm that did essentially normal usual care that you would normally do, which is essentially nothing, or the intervention arm got a tablet-based exercise. And so they were given access to um, a tablet and they would do um, these exercises uh, for at least one hour per day for at least 10 days prior to their surgery. And these tablet-based exercises was testing their memory, speed, attention, flexibility, and problem solving. 
Some of you might have seen what this looks like, and it's under the trade name of Luminosity. I don't own any uh, interest in this company, but this is what was used by the researchers because it was readily accessible at that, that point. And so basically subjects were in uh, this study doing luminosity for an hour a day, at least an hour a day for uh, at least uh, 10 days prior to their surgery. And their primary outcome that they wanted to measure was incident delirium. Like how often would a person develop delirium in the hospitalized setting in, in this case? So just showing some of their results, the majority of their subjects, um, their average age was 67. Majority of individuals were female. Mini mental status score was 29, so quite high. Education level average was 14. And most people were undergoing for general surgeries and orthopedic surgeries. So these are planned surgeries. But the interesting thing is that their ASA level was three. And what ASA uh, is, it's really a, a marker of severity of disease. It goes from a scale of one to, I believe, six. I want to say, uh, I think it's six. But a three, what a three usually indicates is that it indicates that this patient has severe systemic disease, having one or more moderate to severe chronic condition. So not incredibly healthy, but in the moderate range, but it's controlled. And so what they were able to show was that in the control group that there was incident delirium of 23%. So of those people within the control group, nearly uh, um, a quarter of them developed delirium. And then 14.4% in subjects which translates to an absolute risk reduction of 8.6% and a number needed to treat of 11.6, so essentially 12. And so how you, what we talked about number needed to treat before is that you could treat one patient, excuse me, treat, treat 12 patients to get an outcome reducing delirium by one, which is pretty remarkable as well. And so what the researchers also showed was that the incidence of delirium was decreased in those who were compliant. Because they do talk about compliance was a huge challenge in these subjects that only about 8.8% of them completed the goal of 10 hours per study protocol. And so even doing 10 hours was a challenge at that point. And so 10 hours of cognitive exercises appears somewhat protective at this point. But again, there are some caveats to, to, but to this is that it's a very small study. It needs to be better looked at, but the harm to it is relatively um, uh, minimal from my opinion. Okay. So non-pharmacologic management is help. Uh, so we talked about help all already. Please use it to implement it. Um, how I would implement this and put it into clinical practice is this, is that if you had a loved one or a client that you would measure with using those screens that we talked about, uh, uh, measure their risk factors, uh, those four risk factors that we had showed on an earlier slide, if their risk for developing delirium is moderate to high, you would want to implement some of these interventions that we talked about with help. And then you would want to get their hospital care team to implement some of these as well. And so as, as we come through this pandemic and hospitals allow more visitors to attend to their loved ones within the hospital, education is, is one of the primary things about help is that if you don't know that this is evidence-based medicine and you could use it, and you don't know that this can be implemented for those individuals that have an increased risk of delirium because you don't need a physician to orient that person, for example, that significant other, that loved one, that family member who is already visiting can do that. It can also make sure that the glasses are on, range of motion, the same thing, that you don't need a doctorate in physical therapy to range of motion and large joints. Those are things that a family member can, can do if allowed by the same thing with oral hydration as, as well. The sleep hygiene, the same thing. Warm glass of milk or warm glass of herbal tea and relaxation music or back rub or rubbing as another part of the body. So these are simple interventions that can help reduce delirium, particularly those individuals that you are deemed are at high risk of delirium. There are other interventions that we will kind of just touch upon a little bit 
as well moving forward. And they talk about pain management in the AGS guidelines is appropriate pain management. Also appropriate medication use, making sure that people are oxygenated, proper bowel and bladder function, a geriatric consultation, uh, if that is available within your hospitalized setting and staff education as, as, as well. And, and, but I really the thing that I wanted to focus more on was help. Okay. And where I practice is in the skilled nursing facility in, in environment. And I'm sad to admit that there's very, very little evidence for preventing delirium in long-term care. Um, this is a summary of a Cochrane database review. And what, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, a Cochrane database uh, review is, is where uh, an individual or a group of researchers would do a deep dive in looking at all the interventions of high quality and pull out things and pull out studies that they deem of high quality to say, this is the evidence and the state of our evidence for this right now. And unfortunately, there is uh, very little evidence for interventions for preventing delirium in older adults in the long-term care setting. Um, what they were able to show that there were two single component interventions of good quality studies. One was a computerized trigger where a pharmacist um, looked at medications when certain classes of medications appeared, uh, and that led to a decrease in incident delirium. There was also an educational intervention aimed at identifying risk factors and developing some solutions that were associated with that risk factors, providing education to the staff members within long-term care settings. And unfortunately, there was another non-pharmacologic uh, intervention, but unfortunately, the, this was only a feasibility study looking at multi-components. And again, one of these things was about education within this, uh, but I'm, I'm very sad to say that there was limited evidence on interventions for preventing delirium in older adults in the long-term care setting. So if there are any researchers out there, this is a prime niche for you to develop a career in very similar to Sharon's work, Dr. Inouye's work. So the last thing that I want just in summary is that another tips for improving the patient care is just make sure that you, in, you initiate the interventions for those at higher risk to prevent delirium, okay. Case two, um, our patient coming back to case two, you might have forgotten, this was the gentleman who fractured the right elbow. Surgery is unfortunately delayed. On hospital day two, he has pain with movement. He falls asleep during the interview and the uh, RN staff reports there's really no issues overnight. In quotes, this person was described as sleeping quietly. Um, the exam is unremarkable, uh, except for that he's actually lethargic and he's not breathing very well at this point. The, his neurological exam is non-focal, meaning that he doesn't have any signs of a stroke. And what this really, this case really illustrates is that there's two different types of delirium in general. There's the hyperactive type, and that's the type where when we had that very first um, table listed a lot of those things, the agitation, the picking, the visual hallucinations, the irritability, aggression. This gets our attention. This gets our attention and that's what we react to. But there's actually another type of delirium that we think that many researchers think that is much, much more prevalent and that's the hypoactive kind. And that is where like this case highlights sleeping quietly. Individuals are sedate and that they're not seen as a problem and so that you can focus on other patients. There's, re, and there's psychomotor retardation. And so these people are uh, hypoactive in general. And what I would also say about that is too, is that there's a mixed component where individuals can bounce between the two actually. And again, highlighting that fluctuating course that you will see as well, okay? This next, part of this slide talks about how to evaluate a person with delirium. And so there's a management part that we talked about all already. Uh, and really I wanted to talk more about the non-farm treatments of 
people who have delirium, but we're gonna talk a little bit of the evaluation part of it. So unfortunately, there's not a gold standard. I wish that there was some sort of algorithm to, to, to let you know it's like this is what we do for all patients. And, and there's not one single gold standard for that. And part of that is that every individual has uh, predisposing risk factors and precipitating risk factors. And so you have to individualize that. There is a framework that I'll provide for those clinicians to kind of think about a more uh, uh, systematically, okay? And what I would kind of liken or, th or, or coming back to the concept of falls as well is that think of delirium as a geriatric syndrome. And so there are multiple factors that can have uh, contribute to that phenotype or contribute to that condition of delirium. What the arrow here is supposed to signify is that the environment has a component, the dehydration has a component, age-related changes can also have a component playing into a person developing delirium. But for example, delirium, uh, or in this uh, instance, the environment might have a greater impact. And that is highlighted by the um, boldness of this arrow or the size of this arrow, indicating that maybe the environment has a bigger impact in this case um, as well. And research has actually borne that out, is that when researchers have looked at, well, what has caused delirium? Rarely do you find delirium as one definite cause, uh, and that's incredibly rare. And so nearly 50% of cases will have more than one cause of delirium. And, and so if the take home point is, if you find one, keep looking. On average, for every single person, older adult who was hospitalized in, uh, and developed incident delirium, usually that's 2.8 causes that are contributing per uh, patient with delirium. So if you find one, the take home point is keep looking. There might be others that are contributing to that as well. Okay. This is a mnemonic that has always worked for me. And this is the framework for the clinicians out there to have a systematic way of thinking through, am I looking for reversible causes of delirium? And the great thing about this mnemonic is it actually spills out deliriums. And so think about drugs as a contributing factor, not also initiation of drugs, but also withdrawal of drugs as well. This, all, this occurs in the acute setting where medications are stopped appropriately, but then not reinitiated, for example, and then people can develop withdrawal symptoms from that. Think of sensory impairments, so ears and eyes, and so people who have vision or a hearing impairment, and they're placed into an unfamiliar environment can develop hearing impairment, and alcohol withdrawal too as well. Any type of low O2 state uh, infection standing for eye. And so think about pneumonia, urinary tract infections, but also skin infections too, uh, as a possible cause, particularly if they're coming from a facility-based care. Uh, retention, and not only of urine, but also of stool. So the constipation and obstipation we talked about. The other R is the physical restraints that you might be using and could be contributing to that. Post-ictal states. Uh, and so a person who has seizures and now it's uh, post their seizures that they have a confusion afterwards. Under hydration and nutrition and under treatment of pain could be uh, a contributor to their delirium and metabolic cases too. And what I'm usually thinking about is high low calcium, high low glucose or high low sodium, but not usually thyroid disease or vitamin B12. Those fall into the bucket of cognitive impairments related to dementia rather than acute causes. And the last S here is subdural hematomas. And so this is usually in a setting that someone who's had a fall and now two to three days later, two to three days later, they're acutely delirious or they're acutely confused at that point. And so it takes that long of a period of time on average for a person to develop a subdural hematoma. And the last S as well, think of substances, just not because they're old, they might not be using drugs. Uh, so think of illicit substances as, as well. The pain uh, and delirium is a clinical conundrum. 
and and I think that it's best to leave it at at that. To say that uh, it poses a a clinical challenge to balance and uh, treating pain and making sure that you're not giving too much pain, but consistently undertreated pain at rest is associated with delirium and preoperative acute pain is also associated with postoperative delirium. And so it's a clinical conundrum trying to balance treatment of pain, but not over medicating. Um, so that's why it's called the practice of medicine. Um, medication review, uh, reviewing a person's medications is part of the assessment of of reversible causes as well. What is highlighted here is that there are a bunch of medications there that can cause and precipitate delirium. But the consistently, there are two classes of medications that, that stand out are the benzodiazepines and diphenhydramine, better known as Benadryl. So if you have any patients on these medicines, talk and, to them and see if you can get them off of it, uh, and particularly in an acute delirious state. But any anticholinergic medications can contribute. So trying to reduce the anticholinergic burden on patients by reducing these types of medicines would be important in that. Uh, uh, and this just really shows that there have been studies that looked at it, and the most consistent thing is the benzodiazepines uh, uh, are the most common medications to avoid in, in older adults and because it's been shown to cause delirium. Okay, a clinical question, actually, um, just trying to get you involved. I don't think I, I have a poll up, but we'll, we'll just go ahead and do it. Uh, so you have a frail 91-year-old woman with Alzheimer's uh, and her mini mental status is there. She's unfortunately sent to the emergency room from the school nursing facility for severe agitation. For the past two days at the nursing home, she's been irritable, she's been pacing, and she's been threatening to hit others and having trouble sleeping. And, um, and, and she thinks that others are out to harm her, so a sense of paranoia. Unfortunately, a few hours ago, she had punched a, another resident within the school nursing facility, and that's why she was sent into the ER at that point. In the ER, she's cooperative, but now she's uh, uh, being placed into a room. She gets out of her bed and she tries to walk the hallways, screaming, incredibly agitated. But when she's redirected back to her room, she unfortunately declines. She insists that she wants to go home and she's not cooperating with testing. And so what's the most appropriate next step? And the medicines here is a benzodiazepine and lorazepam. Give that Haldol, a antipsychotic, request a one-to-one -one nurse uh, for her, administer a different type of antipsychotic sublingually, um, uh, restrain her for a workup of blood and urine. Uh, and the answer to that is to request a one-to-one -one nurse uh, for her the appropriate answer for that. And the part of the reason here is that the antipsychotics which are listed there is there's a black box warning that is associated with that, that there is an increased risk of mortality in patients uh, when you use this. And so it requires informed consent and it requires decision-making with their durable power of attorney or their decision-maker to, to inform them that I'm going to start this medicine because, um, and it increases your mortality and that it has an increased risk of dying for people who have baseline dementia. Um, and so it requires a lot of discussion and thought and just not just initiating it at that point in time. And already the lorazepam was not the right answer just because we talked about not initiating the benzodiazepine, okay. And when to use an antipsychotic, it really has to do with safety and how dangerous the situation is. And it's really important to establish a clear diagnosis for the symptom and what the symptom that and the sign that you're trying to target. And what um, and to explore past treatments and also caregiver strategies that have worked. It would be really helpful for in this example, for the staff, for example, to discuss with the skilled nursing facility uh, uh, caregivers there to say, well, what has worked in the past? And is this something that is new or is this something that, that uh, is repeatedly has happened before and how would you de-escalate in this situation? Okay. Um, Farm 
management. Uh, this talks about antipsychotics. Uh, these are the typical versus the atypicals uh, for the clinicians who are listening in. There are side effects that has to do with sedation, blood pressure drop, QTC prolongation, and met metabolic effects. It just talks about the differences between the typical versus the atypicals at that point. The take home message with the use of antipsychotics is to use the lowest effective dose. Whatever medication you use at that point, the best uh, data out there is for risperidone and Haldol, uh, and it, it's all dependent upon where you trained, but the take home message is use the lowest effective dose. The other take home message is when you use an antipsychotic, is actually to have a limited time duration on it. Is if you initiate it or you have a provider who initiates it on your family member or your client or your loved one, ask it to be put on only for a limited duration. So for this example, Haldol for seven days. Part of that is related to our healthcare system where there's a lot of turnover in staff. It gets initiated and we forget about it. And so it's really important to have that just automatically stop particularly in our care environments where there's a lot of turnover and a lot of handoffs uh, and to reassess whether or not it's appropriate or not to use. Uh, in conclusion, delirium is often not recognized. Prevention is the most critical. And so please use the interventions we had to talk about in help. Medication review is uh, utmost important. Treat the underlying potential causes with a plural. So if you find one, keep looking for more. And if you do need to use an antipsychotic because safety is of concern for staff members and also for the patient, use the lowest dose for the shortest duration of time and put a stop date on it, okay? I will stop and take questions. Great, um, we've had some questions that have come up. Um, initially, um, Judy was asking about um, Ativan and it's a help in reducing anxiety with patients who have delirium and thinking, um, would an Ativan drip work better in patients with delirium than Haldol? Yeah, and so what I would say to that is that we try to um, not use benzodiazepines in general for uh, delirium. And because people can actually become more agitated on delirium or is it more agitated on the benzodiazepines benzodiazepine like Ativan or lorazepam. Uh, and so that's not the, the, the usual practice. And it really has to do with a goals of care discussion. Uh, and so I also practice as a hospice provider as well. And so in the right clinical context, lorazepam or medications within its class, benzodiazepines can be used, but it has a lot to do with um, what the person's goals of care are in that sense. Um, and Lorraine um, mentioned related to the sleep discussion that you had that um, she loves these interventions that are non-drug based for insomnia and is wondering where would we get that kind of help, um, thinking that it is a more humane way to do things, um, involves personal interaction and communications and dignity. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is a great question. Lorraine, what I would encourage um, individuals to do is request it and ask for it. Um, it's a hard discussion to have and it's about education um, because I could tell you with many of the clinicians and trainees that I work with, when I talk about how to prevent delirium, they, are, they laugh. They laugh and it's like, wow, that's amazing. It works. And someone actually studied it because no, it's not rocket science and I can incredibly agree with you that it's the most humane thing to do and it's the right thing to do, but no one actually knows that it actually works. And so that's part of it is that we have to ask for it and we have to know that it exists. And so talking specifically for help uh, with sleep is that if you had a loved one or if I had a loved one who was hospitalized and an older adult, I would ask, can you make sure that this person gets a cup of herbal tea or warm milk before they go to bed if they have sleeping problems, uh, if, if they have trouble sleeping. And if I was concerned, I would bring in the M MP3 player or and put on uh, a relaxation music for that individual. If their hospital allowed me to stay or allowed another family member or a loved one to stay, 
to be able to give that back rub because I do know that our nurses are stressed and overworked and probably are not able to provide that backup or back rub like our volunteers are able to do for this study, but loved ones can do that, so. Great idea. Um, and Dick Stewart was asking about event triggered delirium and are there any lasting effects of event triggered delirium? Event triggered delirium, what do you mean by that, Dick? If what, if you can unmute. Um, there, Dick, I've opened up for you to be able to share what you meant by event triggered delirium. Okay. Well, we'll move on and and maybe he can you can put that in the chat box. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, the info about um, what families can do to help. Um, uh, Kate is saying that that should be handed out readily. So I was wondering if you know of sort of patient education materials that might be available um, to provide to families about what they can do to help in this situation. You know, um, so Dr. Inouye has an awesome resource. Uh, and so that's where help comes from and much of what I had presented that really works. Um, and so if you put into your browser, hospital elder life program, you'll probably bring up her work. There's probably patient education material and patient resources on that that talks about that that could, could be provided, yes. Um, and Jenny said, um, along the lines of prevention of delirium, um, and um, how might you advise an alcoholic older patient who drinks, say, 10 to 16 ounces of whiskey a night times multiple years to prepare <laughs> to lessen postoperative withdrawal? Seems like alcohol withdrawal um, is not really addressed until it happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I think that um, first thing is to make sure that all the providers are aware that that much, uh, that amount of alcohol is being consumed and how frequently that happens. Because unless you're not in the room, um, some of the providers might not get the, the right information. Um, because let's be honest, some patients are, are not incredibly forthcoming and honest with the amount of substances and alcohol in this case that they consume. And so making sure that that information is conveyed, but gradual reduction would be important in that, that instance. So to uh, prevent that from happening. And if the surgery needs to happen relatively urgently to actually have the providers be aware that alcohol withdrawal is uh, a grave concern and that because one of the treatments for alcohol withdrawal delirium associated with alcohol draw, withdrawal is benzodiazepines. And just like what one of, the, the, one of my responses is that we usually do not use benzodiazepines for delirium. In the instance of alcohol withdrawal, that would be the standard of care. And so that's why it would be important to convey, yes, this is how much you're drinking. We need to proceed with surgery this is probably as good as it's going to get. And there's some urgency to the surgery. Um, but to make the providers aware that if you develop delirium, it's okay to use benzodiazepines. So Mary is um, wondering, instead of using an RN to provide the one-to-one -one care in that one situation, couldn't mm -hmm. a cadre of CNAs be trained and maybe given some monetary benefit to provide that care? She recalls that a sniff in West Seattle using this approach and it seemed to work well and um, cut turnover dramatically as well. Thoughts about that? Yes, yes. You know, um, that was actually a, a actual question and that's how it was raised uh, and written. And so I would agree with you, Mary, that, that other providers and other people can be trained to do this. Very similar to the, the help interventions, they, these are volunteers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, oh, and yes. Jenny had a follow up to the alcohol um, where um, she just said that she thinks people fear that procedures will be canceled so they don't disclose things like alcohol intake. Um, Correct. Jenny, yeah. Yes. And, and I think that that's why 
having a transparent and honest discussion about it would be important, uh, particularly caring for them post-operatively in the hospital. And I've come across that too, is that um, people aren't forthcoming about that and uh, because of various different concerns. Um, so, but one of those is that, yeah. And um, a question about as a nurse, um, how to prevent delirium before it happens to the client. Yeah. About that. Yeah. And so um, the best interventions we talked about were, were showed in HELP. And so that's the Hospital Elder Life Program. And so the orientation, for example, it, is, is part of that. Addressing the sensory impairment, the vision, and the hearing. Addressing the hydration and the mobility or the range of motion. And lastly, the sleep. Like as as a nurse, like those, those are things that uh, I would imagine that you engage a lot with and having the CNAs address some of those and having the providers address some of those as well, so. Well, um, this has been just a really interesting presentation, Dr. Ong, um, a lot of great application of research um, that's very practical for the clinical setting. Um, a lot of people are chatting in about um, how helpful the information has been. So thanks so much. And I will see everyone next week. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.